Um, my name is Anna, and I want to talk uh, today about um, the Watchmaker DNA Lipo Prep um, in the PCR free version and how we've changed a bit so that, that we have a better improvement or performance on the Novosig X. And I work at Clinical Genomics Stockholm, which is part of the Science for Life Laboratory, SciLife Lab in short. And my affiliations are the Kerenska Institute and KTH Roll Institute, Institute of Technology. And SciLife Lab is a Swedish uh, national research infrastructure for accelerating uh, life science research. And um, people from our research groups from different universities work together. So it's a very exciting environment to work in. And uh, apart from the research groups, there's also core facilities or platforms um, at SciLife Lab to support the researchers. And Clinical Genomics is one of those platforms. So a short introduction to our platform. Uh, we focus on uh, translation research and clinical implementation of precision diagnostics to healthcare. So we work with research groups, but also healthcare um, and other platforms at SciLife Lab. And we or other platforms that do basic research, but we take these advanced technologies in genomics and test and implement them so they can be transferred to healthcare. We do this uh, in collaboration with GMS, it's short for Genomic Medicine Sweden. We also have a big focus on uh, clinical studies, um, so with prospective patient recruitment, so turnaround time is um, really of essence for us. And Swedish healthcare is regional, uh, not national, so we have the platform that we work with is distributed in seven different cities so across the country. This is to be able to reach all patients. And in all those cities on the map, um, there is a university hospital. So the medical faculty at the university and the uh, university hospitals work tightly together for an efficient work, which is also very nice. We have about 120 employees in Sweden. So you can read more about that in the paper if you want to know how it's organized. A bit more about our unit in Stockholm. We have been operating for 10 years, about 50 staff, and last year we handled 30,000 samples. So we focus mainly on rare diseases, cancer, and infectious diseases. We have a range of genomic ap genomics applications, so whole genome sequencing, human, and also various microbes. We also sequence different de depths depending on the patient category. We do uh, short read sequencing or targeted sequencing with Illumina, so the exome, and we, have, we offer a variety of twist custom panels from small ones to uh, more uh, larger pan cancer panels for uh, broader coverage. And then to complement the DNA la layer, we also do RNA sequencing. Uh, we run routinely poly capture, but we are also evaluating the, the watchmaker polaris depletion kits, and it seems very promising. And then we are also going into the long read space. So to do this, we have a core infrastructure, um, which I think a key word is automation efficiency. Uh, so we, because we handle quite a lot of samples, uh, so we focus a lot on um, liquid handling instruments, Hamilton's and Bravo, but then we also do short read sequencing. We have uh, six Novosig X, oh, six Novosig machines, so three 6,000, three X plus, and we share those with the other sequencing platform, NGI at SiteLife Lab. And then recently we do, started to do Sapphire optima, Optical uh, Genome Mapping, and then also we do OMT sequencing and sequence with PacBio. And then the data is transferred to our local on-prem IT infrastructure uh, to compute data and store it. And we have a number of tools to manage the data as well. So I want to show you an example of how we work, in this case with healthcare, but it's very, very similar to also when we have research customers. So in this case, there's a patient, a small baby in this case, at the University, Karinska University Hospital. A blood sample is drawn, so we don't do any extraction of RNA and DNA. That's our clients that do that. So the sample is just taken across the street. We're very close to the hospital. We do live prep sequencing, and the data is ultimately transferred to the cluster. The multiplexing is done, and then after that, a specific pipeline, in this case for RTs, is started. Um, and that when that's done, QC is done, if QC is okay, it's uploaded to, in this case, to um, in-house developed tool called Scout. It's very neat. Um, the, the filtered variants are displayed in a very nice way, and there's a lot of features in this tool. And they're dis displayed for uh, our, in this case, the customer, which is a geneticist or a physician at the hospital. So they do the inter interpretation. We don't do that. Many of our workflows are accredited. And the graph on the uh, left, uh, right side here shows in red the curve is the accumulated number of samples since the start. 
And in black bars, it's the number of genomes per month. So we did a few exomes in the beginning, but since 2015, it's only genomes. And we should probably hit 20,000 genomes uh, next month. And I think that's quite a good number of samples, thinking that our region where we normally mostly get our samples from is 2.3 million in inhabitants and almost 20,000 genomes. And in every case is a patient. So that's very nice. And uh, the, the first over 3,000 samples have been summarized in a paper. And those cases that we don't solve with genome sequencing uh, go into the track of research. Uh, so um, take longer to solve, but still uh, we can do reanalysis and uh, we have been taking part in finding new disease causing variants. So I'd like to then go on to talk about our current future human whole genome sequencing methods. Uh, right now we run two methods, TrueSeq DNA PCR free from Illumina as a standard workflow. When we don't have enough input material, which happens sometimes, we go to the next Seq M3 from Biosearch Technology G to do the lucigen, um, 200 gram nanogram inputs. We'd like to replace these methods with one method uh, because we need to, some of the batches are almost full. So we would like to run more often also to <laughs> shorten turnaround times. So four to five batches a week, every day, basically. We need a short and robust protocol. We have clinical samples, also data at least comparable or better than TrueSeq. And we would like to prefer, preferably have a method with enzymatic fragmentation for the ease of automation. So we have uh, tested the DNA library pack with fragmentation from Watchmaker. We started out last year on the Nova 6 6000, quite a few tests in a way. We were new to the method, and then we switched to Nova 6 X in September last year. Also a new sequencing instrument that we had to learn how to operate. So this is the summary of what the samples we've tested and what we've done, so 88 samples, and about half of them are NISTO genome in a bottle samples, so you've got three of them, and the rest are customer samples of various tissue types. And for the main part, we've done enzymatic fermentation, but we also did quarry, so I'll tell you in the next slide, slide why. And we did test two different adapters, and we changed the spray conditions, the post ligation cleanup quite a bit. So this graph uh, essentially shows the history of what we've done. I'm going to walk you through it. So on the y-axis is the mean insert size, because we wanted to just use the washmaker kit off the shell, like according to the protocol, but we wanted to fine tune or find fragmentation type. That was the first step. We input for 350 base pair at mean insert size. Um, the protocol on the right shows the treatment that on the y or the x-axis uh, and syntax is, the first uh, number is fragmentation time, then fragmentation temperature, then um, the first uh, spray cleanup ratio and the second spray cleanup ratio, if we did a second one. And on the x-axis, the sample conditions are organized to the left, only having one spray cleanup, as according to the original protocol. And in the middle, uh, when samples having two spray cleanups, a tandem, an extra cleanup. And then to the far right, uh, Covaris uh, sonicated samples. And the labeling um, are the different um, adapters, so the full circles or dots are TrueSeq adapters, X and then the stars are action. We didn't see any big difference between these. Illumina doesn't really reveal the concentration of the adapters, that's why we wanted to test IDT too, but no difference. And then the colors I think are important, so the orange is Nova 6 6000 sequence samples and the black are Nova 6 X. So if you just focus on this part of the graph first, we started off on the X6000 and found a fragmentation time that suited our aim, about 350 pace per, quite well. Uh, then we switched to Nova 6 X and saw that the insert size dramatically dropped, which uh, is very, very well known now. We didn't, this was very early days back in October uh, last year, so we didn't really figure this out. Was it a kit or was it the sequence? We didn't really know because we actually said that we didn't have a problem with insert size and our true seq samples, which we compared to. But then you should be aware that there is quite a big difference between the watchmaker or the more modern methods in the number of cleanup steps there are. So there are some differences that has an effect on the non -seq -X. Um We were really puzzled by the insert size. They were even below 200 bases. 
So we went to do Kvar uh, um, then sorry, with the end repair step from the watchmaker kit, and that did not improve uh, at all. So we were very puzzled. Um, and then we talked around, we talked with watchmaker a lot, we talked with Lumina and other colleagues around the world, and then we were advised that add a, an extra cleanup to remove any kind of adapter. Uh, in that sample. I mean, you can trim them away in the pipeline afterwards, but they will um, really interfere with clustering and cluster really well on the X. So adding another cleanup step was uh, what's needed to be done. So in this slide, I show fragmentation sprite conditions. So um, what we did, uh, we took part of the library and ran PCR so we could run it on tape station. We only sequence the PCR-free libraries, but this we wanted to see them even though we didn't see any adapter here, there are adapters in very, very tiny amounts, which definitely interfere with the X runs. So the different colors represent different conditions, and the top blue, dark blue condition, uh, is eight and a half minute fragmentation time with only one spike cleanup, and the bottom one is, uh, the green one is a short fragmentation time, only one spike cleanup. So uh, we can play with the fragmentation time and the spike cleanups to shift this curve according to the needs. Uh, which is nice to see. Uh, we chose then 8.5 minutes, 0.6 and 0.65x, because that was quite close to our target of 350 bases. What we all could also see that is adding another cleanup step uh, does reduce the yield of the qPCR, which is expected. You lose material. Uh, uh, some might say that we do quite a long fragmentation time. There is an option of also doing a shorter fragmentation time and then a more streamed cleanup to get the insert size needed. However, we saw that, um, because in that condition you also have to do, or it's advised to do two cleanup steps after the ligation. And we, have, we had quite a low yield, and we sometimes need to resequence libraries, and we also have cancer genomes, so we need quite a bit of library to be able to sequence them. So that's why we chose this condition. And again, here showing uh, the same final condition uh, with two blood samples, customer samples, and uh, they are, um, very robust and consistent in shape <coughs> on cave station. Here we can see um, in the last right column mean insert size that it's increased um, from 350 about to four, over 400. We do see a bit of variation on the X flow cell to flow cell when it comes to insert size. But the libraries are very consistent. Also we looked at the insert size distribution of a number of sample uh, libraries after bioinformatic analysis, um, to the left is Watchmaker Genomics Library Prep Kit, and then on the right, uh, the Illumina Touristic Cover is free. And so we can see that they're between the samples very robust and uh, quite similar. Then for Watchmaker, the two top high ones, those just have more reads. Also wanted to show you AT and GC dropout. So I think in the, this is a business library, you can just focus on the colors. So again, same colors, the orange, uh, is NOSIC 6000 and the black dots uh, NOSIC X. And the left uh, graph is AT dropout and the right is GC dropout. So we could see that uh, for AT dropout, it was generally lower on the X, but it was uh, GC dropout was a bit more scattered. Some were low, some were high, we couldn't really figure it out. So we decided to look at what we normally have, and this is GC dropout for only TrueSec libraries. Um, Again, same colors, no 6, 6000, the orange, and the black dots, no 6, X. And this on the x-axis, it's samples over time, so it's a bit more than 7,000 samples. We've done no changes to our library prep method. It's only changed from sequencing. And from going to X, there is a bit of a scattered pattern, some very, very high GC dropouts. Uh, it's, I think it's clear to see on the violent plot that you have almost like two populations of uh, some low and some high. We see, it's a bit, again, it's the same, it's, it varies flow cells flow to flow cell if a sample, a library is re, um, resequenced and this will uh, affect the coverage, which will drop with a higher GC dropout. We also looked at very calling performance on the 21 samples that we sequenced deeper and down some of the data to 800 million reads. Uh, here we show the recall rate or the calculated recall rate for a combination of SNDs and indels. And uh, I think the lowest one is 0.9929 up to almost 0.995, which is well above our threshold for our, this is the F measure then. 
uh, well above our criteria for the validation of the pipelines. We also looked at some customer samples with structural variants that have been previously prepped with a true sequence sequence on OMSIC X, and we could see that we could find all variants. Both methods, they were, um, the ranking in our uh, tool was similar, and also we looked at all IGV plots, and they were very similar. So we had three cases of SDR expansions in three different genes. There was a bit of variation of how the number of repeats that were found, but it's, it can be quite tricky with short read sequencing to know exactly the number of repeats. But they were all the well, but they were all categorized as pathogenic, so uh, very clear results. And then um, what I show here on the graph is the, the, case for, the fourth case is deletion of a um, of four exons, so 4.7 kb hemocygous deletion in the OFD1 gene. So the top panel is the father on the X chromosome, and the bottom one is the son. It's a very clear uh, deletion. And the fifth case is an inversion of 4.5 megabase. Uh, uh, and there were two breakpoints break very clear to see. Uh, one was in the RMB20 gene. So to conclude, we have tested the PCR-free version of the DNA lower kit with fragmentation. We found it easy to use, easy to work with, and we find it easy to tune. I think that's important. Maybe even more important now when we have the Nomsic X where you have to find your optimal size. We can play around with the spry cleanups, but just to be able to fine tune the fragmentation time is also nice. It gives high yields, so it's always good to have very high conver labor conversion rates. But I think even now it's more important because we have to add that extra cleanup step. It's robust, which is important for clinical samples, and the data is comparable to TrueSeq, which is very nice. So with that, I'd like to thank Carolina and Moua, who've done this wonderful project, uh, which will be ongoing, and Anna, Valtteri, Faye, Anders, Sophie, and the rest of CG so for all the help. And uh, Watchmaker, Amy, Raj, Jen, Christina, Brian, and Josh for all very nice, helpful discussions uh, and with help. And then Tektum, you and Venelit for, he's the local distributor, and then you for your attention.